Lord, we just continue to celebrate you. We worship you not only with our mouths and with our hands clapping and feet dancing, but Lord, we, we even worship you on our instruments tonight. Oh, yeah.
Good morning. morning. It's a very, very different Good Friday men's breakfast on our 53rd annual breakfast. We are blessed to be here and we hope that the Spirit of the Lord shines upon us as we broadcast this service. Uh, The churches and the pews have a handful of people, but it's very empty. But even though it's empty in the church, we hope that this message today by Jeff Staggerwald fills your heart as you worship at home out there through these digital means. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, today is a day to be reverent, to honor the suffering, to acknowledge the struggle. Christ died, was suffered, beaten, humiliated, bloodied, for a purpose. He bore our sin. He faced down evil. He suffered for each one of us. Without suffering, there can be no redemption. Without suffering, there cannot be forgiveness. Without suffering, there cannot be transformation. So we honor the suffering. We honor the struggle. And we are thankful to be here, even in these means, in these times, in these times of uncertainty. Let your peace and your will come through. Let the Spirit be felt. Amen. Well, we welcome the 53rd annual. We're glad to have Jeff here as our speaker. Jeff is joined today by Philip, his son. We're very, very excited about his message that he brings to us. Jeff has lived in Franklin all his life. He graduated from Franklin High School. He's got a wife and three children, two girls, Caitlin and Emily, and of course, young Philip who's with us today. He owns a business in Franklin. He attends and and serves at the Church of the Nazarene in Franklin. And his message today is about his coming to faith with, with the struggles of his son. We thank Jeff for being here, and we thank all the people that are here to help broadcast this. We're very blessed to have Pastor Myers and the TV ministry of Grace Church being able to, to broadcast this out. I know we're live streaming. Bumper Woods is helping us with live streaming through Facebook and other digital means. We always do a youth affirmation when we do this service, at some point in the service. So at this point, we're going to do that. And I want the youth to know out there that in times of uncertainty, there's someone you can turn to. And if we turn to him, we will find peace. We will find rest. We will find hope. So learn about him. Seek him. And you will find. What God has done for the world. We usually have a program in everyone's hands. So we are going to do the responsive reading of talking about what God has done for the world. I will be the leader and I will read and then when it's a response I'll put my hand up and everybody the handful of people in here will talk very loud today so you can hear it at home. Good Friday observes the day in history when God reconciled himself to the world through Jesus' death on the cross. The Bible uses several titles and phrases about Jesus to describe God's reconciliation with the world. Today we focus on the word, reconciliation. God created the man and woman as righteous. They lived in harmony with God, far above good and evil. However, they gave in to the devil's temptation to become like God by knowing good and evil. They fell from God's presence into a world of sin that poisoned their bodies, minds, and souls and turn them into enemies of God. Because God is holy, he is compelled to hate sin. It is not the person, but the sin in and from the person that God cannot be near. 
Sin separates man from God. Sin creates a barrier that man cannot work his way through. The Bible Bible teaches the the sinful sinful mind mind is hostile to God. God. It It does does not not submit submit to God's God's law, nor nor can can it do so. so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. This is the human problem, unable to keep the law. Mankind is unable to earn God's favor and restore the harmony. In this world of good and evil, all of us become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sin sweeps us away. Sin has swept all mankind away from God. The Bible says, What a wretched man am I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And the Bible answers, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Only God reached out to sinful mankind. Is there any hope of regaining harmony with him? The good good news news is, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Apostle Paul reminded believers in Coloss, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you you holy in sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. The way to benefit from God's reconciliation with the world is to personally trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for forgiveness of sins. This is the hope held out in the gospel. Come, Holy Spirit, and enable each of us to see our sinful condition, to realize our need for forgiveness, and to trust Jesus for salvation. At this time, we will have our soloist sing 10,000 Angels. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said crucify him for he's to blame. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. To the howling mob he yielded, he died not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it's finished, he gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called 10,000 angels who loved the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. How blessed are we to hear Ron Richburg this morning and Joe Emanuel to sing. It's not quite the same as 250 men standing up there and singing. 
but we are still so very blessed to have them singing for us. At this time, we will have our speaker, Fred Fry, come forward, and he will present some scriptures. Thank you. Our first scripture reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, and I will be reading verses 1 through 3. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And our second reading comes from the book of Zechariah, chapter 4 and verse 6. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. At this time, we turn it over to Jeff for our message, not by our own strength. Welcome, Jeff. We thank you for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Good, morning. Good morning. It is truly an honor to be chosen here to speak this morning. It's my prayer and it's my, that my testimony and my story of hope will bring the person that already knows Christ closer to him or bring that person that doesn't know Christ to the foot of the cross for the very first time. When I was asked to speak here at this event, I immediately thought, what a great opportunity to give my testimony and story of hope. I never imagined it would be done in this way though with just a few people present and most of the audience viewing through cable or social media. The events of the last month have proven more and more that we live in uncertain times and we don't know what tomorrow holds. The one thing that we can be certain of is that we have a Savior and He went to the cross, He suffered, and He died for each and every one of us. No matter how uncertain the times may be, and no matter what our circumstances are, Jesus is the one constant that goes with us through every trial and tribulation that we may face. We may be quarantined, but we are not alone. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 4 says, The Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. See, we don't even need to fight. What we need to do is we need to turn every battle that we face over to God entirely. And we need to realize that because of the cross, we already have victory through Jesus Christ. As Matt mentioned, I have a wonderful wife, Wendy, and in May of 98, our first daughter, Caitlin, was born. At that time, we really weren't attending church, but we knew we wanted to raise our family in a church. So we started church hopping, and we ended up at the Franklin Church of the Nazarene. And then in 2000, our second daughter, Emily, was born. Shortly after that, Wendy and I, after service one morning, were approached about attending Sunday school. I had never attended Sunday school. I uh, didn't really know much about Sunday school. I was raised Catholic and didn't know what went on at Sunday school. But I, I can remember as we were leaving the service that day, Driving out of the driveway, I turned to Wendy and I looked at her in the eye and I said, I will never attend Sunday school. Well, I now teach 
an adult Sunday school class every Sunday. Tell me that God did not chuckle to himself that Sunday as I was pulling out of the driveway. I'm pretty sure he probably said, this fool has no idea what I'm about to do in his life. And I didn't. I had no clue. We must realize that God's plans and his ways are so much greater than ours. I could spend all morning giving you examples of how many times God has proven this truth throughout my life. Then in 2015, our lives took a dramatic change. Caitlin was preparing to be a senior in high school. Emily was going to be a sophomore. Caitlin was looking into colleges. Emily was getting excited because she was getting, learn, getting ready to drive. Wendy and I were already talking about how in a few years we would be empty nesters. We were already making plans for all the extra time we would have. Wendy even jokingly said that we should have had one more child a little later in life so that we wouldn't have empty nest all at once. You've heard it said that if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. I'm pretty sure God must have been laughing pretty hard after that conversation. Again, I can hear him saying, this fool has no idea what I'm about to do. In August of that year, Wendy's nephew and Philip's biological father passed away to a drug overdose. Philip's biological mother was in ICU for the same thing and headed to rehab. At the time, Philip was 20 months old. Wendy's mother, who was 72 years old, still working and taking care of her ailing husband, was going to take Philip in. God told me right away that we must take Philip and fight to adopt him. Wendy, on the other hand, she wasn't so sure that was the right plan. I can remember I was loading Philip's crib and belongings into the back of our truck as Wendy was standing in the driveway with tears in her eyes, telling our pastor, I don't know that I want to do this. And I could understand that at the time because men, we know mothers take a lot of the responsibility on with young kids. But I knew it's what we had to do. God had told me that right away. So we take Philip in and, and immediately we start the process of trying to adopt Philip. We spent the next 15 months battling the courts and his biological mother for the right to adopt Philip. Not only that, we had spent the 15 months battling many behavior issues with Philip. We had two girls up to that point. We raised two girls. And everyone knows boy is not the same as a girl. And it was a challenge, I will be honest, especially for my wife. But we, in that 15 months, we learned to turn the entire situation over to God. We had to trust that if God sent Philip back with his mother, then that is what would have been best. This trust only comes from realizing the fact that God's plans are greater than ours. In December of 2016, we had settled on an open adoption with Philip's mother. And it was scheduled to take place in March of 2017. As we just heard in Isaiah, I felt like we had passed through the fires, we had passed through the waters, but you know what? Just as the promise is there in Isaiah, God was there with us every bit of it. We felt like because of our strengthened faith and our trust in God, that the battle had been won and that we had gained a son. The one thing that we didn't realize at this time is God was only preparing us for a much larger battle that was yet to come. We so often get caught up in our circumstances that we forget that God is still at work even when it doesn't feel like He's present. There were many times through that 15 months that we didn't think God was even present. But if we, if we would just seek God during those times we would just see how present He really is. He is always with us. In February of 2017, Philip went in to have his tonsils taken out. After the procedure, the doctor came out and she told us that his tonsils were not enlarged, but there was a tumor behind his right tonsil. 
She put us in touch with doctors at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. And exactly one week later, Philip was starting his first round of chemo. He had been diagnosed with high-risk stage 4 neuroblastoma. He had a tumor in his neck, and the cancer was also in his leg, jaw, and skull. We were devastated, to say the least. We couldn't understand how we had fought the last 15 months battling to have Philip just to have possibly cancer take, take him away from us. Philip started on a chemo treatment that was to go five rounds. During treatment, Wendy and I would both stay at the hospital with Philip. She would sleep in bed with him, and I would sleep on the couch on the other side of the room. Every morning, 4 a.m. were blood draws. On a Monday morning, the nurse came in to do the blood draw, and I could hear some commotion over at the bed. And I knew something wasn't right. As I sat there and listened, I realized the nurse couldn't get blood to flow through the port in Philip's chest. I already knew what that meant. That meant taking all the bandaging off of his chest, the tape off of his chest, pulling the needle out, reinserting a new needle, bandaging it all back up. This was a very traumatic process for Philip at this time. We were only a few weeks into the whole cancer thing. So I laid in that bed, uh, on that couch, and I was pleading with God. I said, God, please just let blood flow through that port. Please let the nurse be able to get the blood draw. And I'm just sitting there praying to myself, and I'm pleading with God to let this happen. That morning, God's answer was no. They had to go through the whole process of reaccessing Philip's port. As Christians, if we're going to trust in God, we must be ready to accept His plan and the fact that His answer is sometimes a no or a not now. So, I left the hospital that Monday morning. I had to come back to Franklin to go to work. And I'm driving up Interstate 79, and I was, I was upset, and I was angry with God. And... I'm talking out loud in my truck, and I'm just asking God why. I said, God, Philip has been through so much already. Why could you not just let blood come through that port? That's all I was asking for. I wasn't sitting on that couch asking you to heal him. I was asking you to let blood throw, flow through a port, and you couldn't make that happen. I was struggling. I, I, I was angry, and I was upset. And I was listening to K-Love on the radio as I, was, as I was traveling, and God used the lyrics of Mercy Me's song, Even If, to teach me a lesson that we all must learn. And this, these are the lyrics to that song. They say, sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some, and right now, right now I'm losing bad. I've stood on this stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be all right. But right now, oh right now, I just can't. I know you're able, and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. They say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. Well, good thing a little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, oh, give me the strength to be able to sing, it is well with my soul. So, if any of you have ever watched the NCIS show, the show NCIS, you know what a Gibbs slap is, right? It's where Gibbs, the team leader, slaps one of his team members in the back of the head to say, do you get it? That is exactly what God did to me that morning in my truck. He gave me the proverbial Gibbs slap in the back of the head. He said, don't worry. I have it all under control, and I am with you. Remember what Isaiah 43.1 says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. See, we need to remember that we all are his children. 
That's why we're here today celebrating Good Friday. God sent His Son to the cross to redeem each and every one of us. As Jesus hung on that cross, He knew our names. Each and every one of our names, He knew them. And He said, I'm doing this for you. It was at that moment in my truck that I said, okay, God, Philip's yours, not mine. If you save him from this, great. But if you don't, that's okay too. Because I know I will see him again one day in heaven. And when I do, he will be perfect and cancer free. Jesus teaches us that we must relinquish all control to God. Jesus had his cross to bear, and each of us has our own cross to bear also. Most of the time, when it comes time for us to bear our cross, we don't want to do it because we think it's just too much. It'll be too hard. It's all right to think that. But we cannot let those thoughts keep us from carrying out the will of God in our lives. Jesus thought his cross was too much to bear also. As he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 38 tells us, he told his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Then look what he requests from God in verse 39. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Are we, are we ready to humble ourselves to the point where we turn every situation in our lives over to God and accept His perfect plan? See, when we decide to do that, we have the promises that we heard about in Isaiah. See, our God, God is always faithful. He loves each and every one of us. He can always be counted on. But that means that we must stay faithful when we face our fears. Doing this doesn't mean that our situation will always get easier. But it does mean that God will help us overcome our fears and get us through. Not only does He promise to be right there with us, He also does not require us to do it by our own power. Zechariah that was read just a little bit ago tells us not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. See, it's only through God's Spirit that we can have peace no matter what our circumstances are. God did this for Wendy and I. We were able to turn to Philip and we were able to turn Philip and his cancer totally over to God. After five rounds of chemo, they did scans. And of course, we were sitting in the waiting room and we were expecting good results. Scans take five to six hours. We had been sitting there for almost seven. And as we're sitting in the waiting room, we see Philip's oncologist walk down through the hallway and look at us. Wendy and I look at each other and said, this can't be good. We weren't supposed to see the oncologist. It wasn't good. Philip had actually had more cancer in his body. It had spread to other parts of his body. I can remember as the doctor's telling this, this sitting there, and I, I, they, they had changed the protocol. The protocol was saving his life. And now the protocol had been changed to prolonging his life. And I can remember asking the doctor, so you, and I'm sobbing, and I said, so you mean to tell me he's not going to reach adulthood? And they sat there and they just shook their head no. <laughs> Again, we were devastated. But after the initial shock, we continued to put our trust and our faith in God. The doctors decided to start Philip on a chimeric antibody treatment, along with another chemo drug. This treatment involved being in the ICU for a week at a time every third week. The treatment attacked the nerve endings in his body and was very painful. It caused him to become weak and very sick. The whole week we were in ICU, he was on a mor morphine drip. Before we started this first round, the doctors warned us of all the side effects, the pain, the sickness, what it would do to him. But we still had no idea what to expect. 
By the second hour of that first treatment, Philip is screaming from the pain. And there's nothing we can do to console him. I'm carrying him around the hostel room, bouncing him, trying to console him. All while he's hooked up to, he's got IVs and monitors all hooked up to him. And, and, and there's nothing we can do to console him. So I, as I'm holding him, I ask him, Philip, do you want me to pray? He answers me, he says, yes. As I began to pray aloud in that hospital room, Philip started to calm down. And within two to three minutes, he was calm. Philippians 4, 6-7 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. See, we need to pray through our circumstances. But not only do we need to pray through our circumstances, we need to ask others to pray us through our circumstances also. If we look back at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus gives us the perfect example. Not only is he praying to God about his circumstances, but he also asks the disciples in Matthew 26, 41 to watch and to pray. I can testify that prayer and the prayers of others are sometimes the only thing that can carry us through. If you are struggling to have peace in your life, I would suggest that you start by examining your prayer life. And not only that, ask others to pray for you. I've witnessed a peace that passes all understanding in my life, the life of my family, and the life of my young son. Even to this day, Philip knows the calming power of prayer. So the chimeric antibody treatment goes 12 rounds. The doctors felt like the treatment was not working anymore. It was just holding the cancer at bay. But it had removed all the cancer in Philip's body except for at the tumor in his neck. And even the tumor in his neck had, had shrunk considerably. The doctors admitted to us that they never thought Philip would go 12 rounds. And they never thought that he'd have this much improvement. That's the power of prayer. You see, not only were we praying during all of this, but there were people and churches all over this country, and even in other countries, lifting Philip and us up in prayer. It amazes me when I come across someone that I don't know, and they realize who we are, and they realize who Philip is, and they're like, I prayed for him. We have no idea how powerful prayer is, people. Prayer is the only thing that get, gets us through sometimes. Not knowing what the next step was going to be, Wendy began praying that God would grant Philip's doctor wisdom. They considered surgery and has to meet with the surgeon in Pittsburgh. The surgeon felt that Philip was a candidate for surgery. But his doctor decided to send us to Philadelphia to see the head of neuroblastoma for a second opinion. So in February of 2018, we headed to Philadelphia to see Dr. Mose. She had already consulted with Philip's doctors in Pittsburgh, and she had seen his most recent scans. As we sat down with her, she ruled surgery, surgery out immediately. Wendy and I are sitting there and we're like, okay, why did we just make a six hour trip to Philadelphia then? Dr. Mazze proceeds to tell us about a phase one clinical trial that she is conducting. And she believed that Philip was a perfect candidate for it. There were only two spots left in the trial. We enrolled Philip in it immediately. Try to tell me that God's timing is not perfect. We had spent the previous year watching Philip endure treatments that caused him great pain and sickness. But everything we went through and the time it took led us right to where God wanted us and when he wanted us there. Before the trial, Philip had to have scans done. After being sedated for five plus hours, having scans done, two bone marrow biopsies done in his hips, they informed us that we needed to take Philip over for an EKG. 
Imagine trying to keep a grumpy, fussy, sore child calm for a, and still for an EKG after going through all that. As the nurse is hooking all the leads up to Philip's body, he gets fussier and fussier and crankier and crankier, and he won't sit still. And we're trying to console him. We're, we're asking him, Philip, it just takes a minute. Just sit still for a minute. And he wanted nothing to do with it. And as we're consoling him, Philip looks at me and he says, Daddy, will you pray? So I begin to pray out loud. And as I'm praying in that room, Philip calms down. The nurse continues to put the leads on his chest. And he sits still and the EKG is, EKG is completed. I can still remember looking at the nurse and seeing the surprise in her face. I could tell that that nurse didn't know the power of prayer, but she witnessed it that morning. We must remember to seek God out. That's what Philip did that day. He reminded me. Seek God out when we have fear. Seek God out when we have trials. So we start on the, the, the clinical trial and what was amazing is the clinical trial consisted of Philip taking a few pills. What was, what was even more amazing after the last year of treatment making him so sick and pain, full of pain is there was only, the only side effect to the pill was an increase in appetite. Wendy and I had a five-year-old that started eating like a 16-year-old. It was crazy to sit down at dinner and watch my son out eat me <laughs> at five years old. Because those of you who know me know I like to eat. So after six months on the trial, in August of 2018, Philip goes in for scans. After scans, the doctor comes in and says, Philip's cancer free. Here sits a healthy boy. He loves to live life. When about three years ago, we were told that there was no hope. We were told he would not reach adulthood. We were told that we're just going to try to prolong his life. See, we read of all the miracles that Jesus performed up until his crucifixion. And we so often forget that he's the same today as he was then. And that he's still in the business of performing miracles and answering our prayers. Remember how I mentioned that Wendy had begun to pray for wisdom for Philip's doctor? After being healed, Philip was at Children's in Pittsburgh for routine blood work and met with his doctor. Wendy began to thank her for sending us to Philadelphia. Wendy told her, I was praying that you would have wisdom. The, the doctor proceeded to tell Wendy, God told me to send you to Philadelphia. Tell me that's not amazing. All I can say that, it just baffles me. It amazes me, and I praise God for it. Here's a doctor who's based on science. But she knows who God is. And she listened to God, and she was obedient to God to send us to Philadelphia. I praise God for that this morning. The last five years have been a whirlwind of valleys and peaks. But as I look back on them, it amazes me to see how God was always right there and working, even when we thought he wasn't present. We were never alone. And God had the battle under control at every moment. So often we feel like we have to muster up the strength to fight battles. We don't even have to do that. All we really need to do is humble ourselves to the point that we relinquish control of the situation to God. Once we do that, God takes over, the, takes over and, and He fights the battle through His Spirit. Remember, we already have victory because Jesus died on the cross for you and me. Victory has already been won. I don't care what you're facing, what you're battling, victory has already been won through Jesus Christ. It also amazing, it's also amazing to me to look back and see how God was preparing my family for this journey years in advance. 
God knew what we were going to face and changed situations in our lives so that we would be ready for the battle when the time came. Not only that, He put people in our lives that we would need to help get us through. One other thing God did as we faced this cancer battle with Philip, He blinded Wendy and I. And what I mean is, Wendy and I, as we were going through treatments and through the chemo and the chimeric, we would look at Philip and we'd say to each other, you know, he doesn't even really look that sick. We'd say to each other, besides the bald head, you wouldn't know he had cancer. We now look back through the photos as Philip was going, all the photos we have as Philip was going through treatment, and we can't believe how sick he really looked. He looked horrible, I'll be honest. But God knew as we were battling, as we were going through that, that we couldn't handle seeing Philip looking sick. And he blinded us from that. I truly believe that, and I know that for a fact. See, God knows what each one of us can and cannot handle. And he always provides a way through. So, I don't know what anyone hearing this message is going through. I don't know what they're facing. But I do know that we all face and we all battle something. And I want to leave you with these thoughts. First, we're not alone. We heard in Isaiah 43, I have summoned you by name, you are mine. If we look in Joshua 1.5, it tells us that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Secondly, we do not have to fear. It doesn't matter what our circumstances are. It doesn't matter what we have done. It doesn't matter what we've been through. Again, in Isaiah 43, it says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. See, Jesus went to the cross. He died to redeem each and every one of us. He sits today at the right hand of the Father, and He intercedes for each and every one of us. He says, I have paid the debt in full. He's covered each and every one of us. It's paid in full for all of us. We we do not even need to fight the fight. We have to turn it over to God completely. Zechariah 4.6 told us, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Jesus could have easily taken himself off of that cross. We heard the song just a few minutes ago. He could have summoned 10,000 angels. He didn't have to go through it. He didn't have to endure the pain. He didn't have to endure the humiliation. But he chose to bear it so that we may have life. And that we may have life to the full. It's now time for us to go into this dark world and bear our cross so that others may see the eternal life that Christ has to offer. I'd like to thank the men of this committee for choosing me to speak here today. It's a group of men that truly believe in shining the light of God in a dark world. And they put put a lot of effort and time into preparing this service each year. I've been blessed to get to know them. I also thank God for sending His Son to the cross for my salvation for your salvation, for everyone's salvation. It's a free gift for each and every one of us. All we have to do is accept it. I pray pray this testimony is the light that someone needed during a dark time. As we go through this life, may we bear our cross and pray as Jesus did that night in the garden. My Father, not as I will, but as you will. I'd like to close in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning. We praise you. We praise you because we are saved people. We praise you because you died on a cross. And as as you hung on that cross, Lord, you knew each of us by name. We praise you that you want that kind of relationship with us. I come to you this morning, Lord, and I ask, You help each one of us to turn every situation in our life over to you completely. I ask that you help each one of us to seek a closer relationship with you. 
And I ask, Lord, that as we go out into this dark world, that we show people Your light. And that we be Christ-like and we do Your will. Give us the strength to do that, Lord. We know that it's a dark time in this world, Lord. As we see this pandemic taking over across the world. But we know that You are in control. And we praise You and we thank You for that. I just ask that You bless us and go with us. In Your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. We will have a soloist drawn again with the old rugged cross. closing, the committee went long and hard about whether we should even have this service and what to do with the governor's orders and all that good stuff about life-sustaining business and essential practices and all that good stuff. Well, as we went back and forth through email because of the social distancing and maybe even a Zoom session, and I know some guys on our committee might have been their first video conferencing Zoom session. We turned it over to Jesus. We trusted in Jesus. And although our traditions of this service, of the fellowship of 250 men and coffee and Clark's Donuts is different this year, the message is still the same. Jeff, we thank you for that message. I needed to hear that message. It, it brought me closer in my relationship. And I know that was your goal, was that it brings all of us closer for believers and then those that are non-believers out there that you might be saved. And as we went back and forth as a committee, I think the true testament was when 
Phil Thompson, our leader, finally told the Derek, run the article, we're running the service. And the response from the lady who worked for the Derek was, this service is near and dear to my heart. My husband was saved at that service many, many years ago. That is why we come together on this day. That is why we honor the reverence of Good Friday. That is why we, we look and we dive into the suffering of Jesus Christ through this service. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. The opportunity to gather, the opportunity to reflect, the opportunity to share the story of coming to Christ. I can't tell you how many times God probably said in my, my life, this fool has no idea what I'm about to do. I'm going to carry that one forward, Jeff. Christ died for you. Reflect on that. You're worth it out there, each one of us. He died for me. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.